we got a microphone. We got a working microphone. We got a new camera girl. And I <laughs> right? You're breaking out on a solo career right now, right? <laughs> tonight we're going to see a solo performance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Soul Food Books. Give a holler and a clap if you're awake tonight still. Good. That means we're doing our job and the coffee's flowing right. My name is Clint McCune. I'm one of the owners here at Soul Food, and it's a privilege to host this night, the first Wednesday of the month, a night that we dedicate to looking up to the stars and mapping out an understanding of the world we live in. Tonight, we get a rare night where uh, it's a solo night. Uh, Jeff is heading to Bali tomorrow, and Rick's is already there. Tonight, we get just a night with Jeff all our own. Please welcome Jeff Jower to the stage. Thank you, Clint. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for uh, giving up the debate to, uh, to get some real entertainment, to get some, to get some truth or another version of truth. Thank you so much, Clint. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is a, you know, we live in transitional times and this is a transitional evening. Uh, Rick Levine and I have been doing this together for a couple of years and uh, about four years, I think. And last month, my wife, Danique, and I were out of the country, so Rick soloed. Rick is in Bali. I'm leaving for Bali tomorrow, so I solo. I'll be back here in November. Rick gets to lounge around in the rice fields and on the beach for another month. So you'll have the whole team back here in December. Another thing I'd like to acknowledge, even though she is not here, Julie Balatico, AKA Julie Web Girl, has been recording us almost since the beginning. She is the tall, slender woman who sat in the front here and held that, micro, uh, that camera in her Taurus arm without moving for some time. Julie has moved on to uh, a more joyous and interesting life. And so we have a new camera operator tonight. It's my wife, Danique. And, uh, and also, Rick always operates the uh, computer. So give us a break if we have some technical issues. For those of you who are new here at Astrology Night, I'm going to talk 40 minutes or so, give or take, about the collective astrological patterns that are coming up over the month of October. These, this is the astrological weather. It rains, or in our case, doesn't rain on all of us, yet each one of us experiences things in our own unique way. If you're interested in getting a quick mini reading, a look at your birth chart, after the, the first part, we're going to take about a 10-minute break, and then three names will be picked out, and I will do a mini reading, two or three or four minutes, talking about a real individual chart. If you'd like yours to be used as an example, please put your first name and your birth data, which is time, date, and place of birth, on a piece of paper, drop it on the table, and I'll do a little drawing on the break. Okay. You know, I realized in preparing for tonight that I was going to start by saying this is a really interesting month. And then I realized that Rick and I have said that for 48 <laughs> consecutive months. It seems to be, uh, and perhaps it's because we're astrologers and we get to watch the wheels of the planets move around, and we've got lots of things to talk about, but this month is unique in a particular way, and that is that the planet Saturn is changing signs. Now, Saturn changes signs every couple of years, and this uh, what, uh, Friday, the 5th, Saturn leaves lovely Libra behind, where it has been for two years, and moves into steamy Scorpio. Now, Saturn is the planet of boundaries, limits, and hard, cold reality. It was an old-fashioned astrology called the greater malefic, the big bad guy. It was supposed to be bad because Saturn is about boundaries and limits. The Greek name for the planet Saturn, which is a Roman name, was Kronos, Father Time, the limits of time, the mortality that we all experience, and other limits like gravity and the limits of nature are a great deal of what Saturn is about. And yet, as I like to say, Saturn is the planet that says no, 
but means yes. It shows us where we hit the walls, where we hit the boundaries, and yet, if we are clear enough about a boundary, what it's made of, how we got there, what it means, we're halfway over it. So that Saturn also shows us where and how we can build. Well, Saturn has been in the polite sign of Libra, as I said, for the past couple of years, which traditional astrology considers to be a favorable place for Saturn. Saturn's sense of rigor, of absoluteness, seems to go well with Libra's sense of fairness and harmony. Well, Saturn is about to wrap up what it has done in Libra, which means we've got a couple of more days to work out balance within ourselves. Libra, the sign of the scales or the sign of the balance, has to do with the duality of self and other, of yes and no. And part of the function of Saturn and Libra has been to build bridges between our yes and no, I, the I and the thou, the self and the not self. And to varying degrees, we have all been successful or frustrated in establishing a greater sense of clarity, objectivity, fairness, and balance in our relationships. So an interesting exercise for the next day or two is to do a review of where you have been able, of, of noticing where you have been able to overcome an obstacle, to meet another person, to meet another idea in a way that at least is open. Libra doesn't mean I accept your story. It means I'm willing to listen to it to put it on the table, to put it on the scales, and weigh it with a reasonable degree of objectivity. I'm sure we've all had successes somewhere. There is some situation, there is some person where you thought you were hitting a wall, where you thought you were absolutely opposed to the idea, the person, or the activity, and where you at least made some accommodation, built some sort of a bridge between yourself and that other person. Is the red light on? <laughs> Why? I don't know. I know it was <laughs> Welcome to Soul Food. <laughs> <laughs> this is astrology night, and we're going to talk about. <laughs> what's going on. And I started with, and to recapitulate for the home listeners, audience who didn't get this, uh, I'm talking about the fact that Saturn, the planet of boundaries, limits, and hard cold, don't touch that button, Danique, <laughs> that Saturn, the planet of boundaries, limits, and hard cold reality is changing signs. On the 5th, that's two days from now, and is moving from lovely Libra where we've been bound by, limited by, challenged by, and hopefully have had some degree of success in establishing objectivity in our lives. Look at those places in your life where you've been able to accommodate or where someone has been able to accommodate you. Those are the successes of Saturn and Libra. Look at those places where you've compromised and you wish that you hadn't. And also think about those places, those relationships, where there are still the barriers of difference that you would like to overcome. Because Saturn, although it shows us what's not working, it helps clarify where the work is. Now, this uh, Friday, the 5th, Saturn moves on to Scorpio. Scorpio is the sign that tends to make people shudder out of respect, out of fear, out of desire, out of ignorance, out of uh, uh, the challenge of looking at this sign of deep passion, feeling, need, desire, and transformation. There is absolutely nothing wrong with Scorpio except that it encapsulates a number of subjects that are difficult for us, like death, sex, power, 
exploitation, shared resources, just a couple of lightweight subjects like that. Saturn in Scorpio suggests that over the next two years, we are going to go deeper into the world of relationships and that we are going to examine the underlying needs and motivations that we normally don't want to look at. See, Libra is lovely, it's pretty, it's polite, it's gracious. Entering the Libran world just means be smiley, be nice, and be reasonable. Entering the Scorpio world means go to the last place you want to go. Look at the darkest corners of your life, of power, of desire, of resentment. Scorpio is a place, it is a sign in which we, it doesn't create toxicity, it measures it. It contains it. It stores it up until such time that we encounter it, work with it, and go through whatever steps we need to transform ourselves. Scorpio is really paradoxical. It's a fixed sign. It occupies the middle of one of the four seasons of the year, which means it's stubborn and willful. And yet, it is a sign that's meant to concentrate energy so deeply, so powerfully, so intensely, that we come through on the other side, that we are transformed. Saturn in Scorpio takes us beyond the polite Libran level of, isn't that nice? And we should get along to, I'm not getting my needs met. I'm not sure what they are, but they are not getting met. I am hungry for something that I might not even want to describe or talk about. Saturn in Scorpio is not about meeting our higher angels. It is meeting our lower angels with our higher selves. See, whenever we run into challenging and difficult issues, particularly of a complex emotional, sexual, power, financial, flat-out survival level, which is where Scorpio often hangs out, it's very tempting to go into denial. What do I really want? Oh, I don't know. I'm fine or I can't say it, or I can't put my finger on it. Well, the fact of the matter is you probably can put your finger on it, but you don't want to because it's a stinky finger. It's not your nice finger. It's not your pretty bejeweled ringed finger of delight, openness, spirituality, <laughs> divinity, and welcoming to all of the possibilities of the world. No, it is a Scorpio finger that points to the forbidden places your forbidden places. What is it that um, is forbidden for you that's still a little bit interesting? Because Saturn in Scorpio is likely to run you up against it, which is actually a good thing. Better to meet your shame, your fear, your doubt, your unfair desire. I mean, that's a big thing about Scorpio. Scorpio is not about fair in a social sense, which Libra is. Let's be fair, let's have an election, let's vote and see who's most popular. Scorpio doesn't give a crap about that. Scorpio's calculation is made at a deeper emotional, unconscious, and karmic level. There is a justice in Scorpio, but it's not the kind that you can necessarily rationalize. So here's the deal. Those places where you're willing to walk up to your, your fear and your desire and your disappointment, and hold that space in your consciousness, that's where you will be enriched. That is also where you model for the culture the courage to face the darkness, to face the dark night of your soul. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're all going to go through some sort of horrible, terrorizing Saturn and Scorpio experience day in and day out over the next two years. As I said, most of us are going to kind of duck this stuff much of the time. It's damn impolite to say, nice car, can I have it? Nice body, can I have it? I want what you have that I'm not supposed to have. Well, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily act on those impulses, but facing them builds trust, trust in yourself. Oh, it's easy to trust me when I'm reasonable, when I'm good, when I'm nice, when I'm sweet, when I am with my higher angels. The problem is when I meet my darker angels, or even worse yet, when we deny them. 
As I said, Saturn is barriers, and Scorpio represents deep, dark places where transformation occurs. So we're likely to want to stay away from it. But here's what happens, I think, if we're unwilling or unable to encounter the shadow parts of ourselves, which is really what Saturn in Scorpio is about. At the very least, at the very least, we lose a tremendous opportunity for competence, to be more competent, to be more skillful in making our way through the world, and yes, to be more powerful. Scorpio is about power. And yet we have this odd notion, I've mentioned here before, that power corrupts, which was what Lord Acton, the English uh, writer, said. It's bullshit. Powerlessness corrupts. Truly powerful people don't exploit other people. Truly powerful people don't rip off people. Just because somebody's got a big body, a big job, a lot of money is your boss, and bullies you, that's not coming from that person's place of power. It's powerlessness that makes us corrupt, that makes us sleazy and sneaky and denying the truth for ourselves, or losing the capacity to meet others in the deepest place. Because when you show up to meet the parts of you that aren't all sweet, nice, delicious, and lovely, but are desirous and hungry, you open a door to intimacy, to closeness. See, Libra's the beginning of the relationship. Libra's like the dating. And this is wonderful. It's like the constantly trying to please the other person, which culminates in a marriage for some, or some formalization, and then we get Scorpio. <laughs> the purpose of relationship is not so that we get up every morning and get to smile at somebody who's going to prove the hell out of us. And any of us who's been a in a relationship understands that. That a fundamental purpose of relationship is to meet the things in ourselves that we can't see on our own, that we can't see from the inside. In fact, in, a, in an astrological chart, the seventh house, which is a lot like Libra, the seventh sign is the house of relationship. And yet, in the old days, it was also called the house of one's open enemies. What does that mean? Relationship is an open enemy. It's an open enemy to your unconscious self because you're confronted by somebody who's going to push buttons. Even the most loving and kind person is going to push buttons. Well, Saturn in Scorpio is really moving to the deeper level of relationship in which there is a much greater amount of calculation about am I getting what I'm putting in? Now, that may not feel very loving and kind and sweet to go, am I getting enough for what I'm giving? Shouldn't I just give? Wouldn't that just be enough? And then I'll take back what the universe has to offer. That's great if you're a Neptunian. That's great if you're very Piscean. That's great if you're a wimp. But if you're interested, <laughs> if you're interested in engaging, there's an honesty with oneself that is really hard. You know, we talk about being honest with one another. That can be difficult, depending on what the issue is. But I think that the biggest issue about lies are the lies of omission that we do to ourselves. It is the things we don't want to say, don't want to think, don't want to feel. But here's the point. If you're willing to go to your Saturn and Scorpio place and discover that you're a greedy, horny, selfish pig, or at least that such a shadow exists within your otherwise pristine and lovely and beautiful and spiritual self. That doesn't mean that you have to behave as a selfish, greedy, horny pig. You don't have to. You can alter behavior, but you need to know what's in the game. You need to know what's on the scale. That's what Saturn and Scorpio is. You don't have to be a bastard to others, but you probably have to meet the bastard inside of you. Now, this is a long process, but what I think it offers is, when we think of it beyond a personal level, because I talk about here frequently the idea that your growth, your awareness, is your contribution to humanity. That these guys who are debating tonight are not going to save the country and save the world. Whoever it is, we're still going to have a Pentagon. We're still going to frack. We're still going to do all this dumb stuff that we do. 
Uranus, the planet of freedom and liberation and breakthrough, is in the do-it-yourself sign of Aries, which means we are all empowered for another five or six years to be the unique genius in our own life whose collective genius, whose collective willingness to go beyond the boundaries of Saturn, to go beyond the bounds of that which is known, can contribute not only to your own awakening, but to the awakening of all of us. So I'm not suggesting that we're going to necessarily go through hell for the next two years. If you imagine a circumstance in your life that was hell until you got used to it and then you eventually liked it, do you ever know a group of people who you met and you go, what jerks, let me get away from them. And for some reason you couldn't and you found out beneath the jerkness that you had a lot in common <laughs> with some of these people. That's a Saturn and Scorpio job. Find something in common with somebody you can't stand. It's a challenge. But what that does is it, 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 it's not about inviting you, Libra-wise, oh, just understand me. It says, no, come in here. Feel my shit. It's like yours, huh? Okay, good. That doesn't mean that we join together in shame. We join together in an understanding that humans are both light and dark. That's all. And encountering that darkness on a personal level will perhaps provide incentive, courage, motivation for those in more public leadership positions to follow. Scorpio is also the realization that resources are finite. Now I get, on a metaphysical level, they are not. There's enough of everything because we humans can't really measure, we can't tell. But Scorpio, on a human level, does represent that time in the year when the leaves fall off the trees, when we've had the, the last harvest in the northern hemisphere and that a calculation is then made, or was by most of our ancestors, of how much food do we have to feed the animals and the people throughout the winter. And if there wasn't enough, that was when you called the flock, whether it was slaughtering animals or exiling individuals. Scorpio does have an aspect of measurement and choice making. What are you willing to give up for what you desire. That, too, is part of the process. Okay, so I'm sure Rick and I will be talking about Saturn and Scorpio quite a bit over the next couple of years, so let me, let me shift gears here and talk about some other things. Thi this, this month, by the way, I think we, we, we sort of go through cycles of expansion, and it's all good, and they're full of faith and contraction and fear. There's a lot of moving back and forth. For example, Yesterday, on the second, Venus, the goddess of love, the planet of love, entered Virgo. And Virgo is a sign that tends to be analytical and practical, and traditionally Venus doesn't like it in Virgo. Because if you have Venus in Virgo, you're perfect. It's fine. <laughs> but the idea is what traditional astrology does is it says planet and sign, are they similar or different? And if they're very similar, great. And if they're very different, that's hard. And Venus is the planet of love, but Virgo is the sign of criticism. It's a sign of analysis. So Venus entered Virgo yesterday and will remain in Virgo until the 28th of the month, and that means that the issues of love and relationship can, in a negative sense, be overly criticized and analyzed. But as I often say about Virgo, the issue isn't what's wrong, the issue is what can you fix, and you don't have to fix all of it to make it better. When we move a millimeter at the core of ourselves, we can accomplish great things. You can move a mile at the periphery and it's not necessarily gonna do you much good. Venus in Virgo is about appreciating the small things so that we can make appropriate adjustments and improvements, but Venus in Virgo, which normally says, I like that, I don't like that. No, that shade of teal, that's a little different shade of teal than the shade of teal that gets me off. So would you please uh, do it differently? Oh yeah, Virgo is kinky. Virgo is very <laughs> kinky. Don't let them fool you. Why? Because Virgo is specific and ritualistic. And that's kinky. 
I can't get off unless it's two semicircular turns over the left shoulder blade, you know, two pats on the right side of the rump, a wink, a pull on the ear, and I'm off. Great, thank you. <laughs> well, Virgo's very specific, which is kinky, in a sense. But Venus and Virgo opposed Neptune yesterday. Neptune, the planet of dreams, illusion, is the antithesis of Virgo. Neptune says, huh? <laughs> or, ha! Huh? It can be a drunken stupor or an illuminated state of awareness. But what it means is that we started the month by saying, you must get things right on the second and the third. Today said, oh, who gives a crap? It's okay. <laughs> well, the higher meaning of Neptune is almost always forgiveness. Find your flaws and forgive them, but do something about them. That would be a way to get the best of both. Then tomorrow, Jupiter, the biggest planet of them all, which has been babbling away in Gemini, uh, Jupiter turns retrograde, or the planet begins to move backwards. When planets appear to move backwards, it suggests that they become less obvious in their expression and that we have to internalize their energy so that Jupiter moving into Gemini represents, uh, I'm sorry, Jupiter turning retrograde is about finding the wisdom within. Jupiter me is called guru in modern Hindi or ancient Sanskrit, and guru is teacher. The planet of teaching, Jupiter is in Gemini, which probably means you have more ideas than you know what to do with. That's the problem with Jupiter in Gemini, because Jupiter is big and expansive and looking for the answer. Gemini never settles for one answer. If one answer's good, isn't, aren't two better? Aren't six better? Aren't three better? Whatever. Well, Jupiter going retrograde has to do with rolling back into our minds, taking some of the learning we've gotten over the past few months, and checking it out and seeing what holds, what still lasts. All right. Then we have another amazing event. And that is, uh, again, on uh, Friday, the 5th. Mercury, the planet of communication, joins Saturn, the planet of hard, cold reality. Well, that's not usually a big deal because they join together at least once a year. And what that means is serious thinking, Saturn's serious, Mercury's thinking. So Saturn, Mercury is serious thinking, concentrated thinking. Or if Saturn operates as a block, frustrated thinking, delays in getting information. So that happens once a year. It's not that big a deal. It can either be sharpening up intellectually or being frustrated by not getting the information that you want. But what makes it fascinating is these two planets join together on the fifth, and they join together in the very last degree of Libra. Now this chart is done for noon, and we've got here Saturn at 2959 Libra, Mercury at zero, Scorpio, they were joined together earlier in the morning. They joined together in the last degree of Libra, and then both that day move on into Scorpio. Now, what's interesting is two planets joined together in the sign of agreement, Libra. You'd think they'd come to some sort of an agreement with one another. And then immediately they go into Scorpio and say, screw that agreement. <laughs> in other words, we get answers. Mercury of intellect joined with Saturn of hard, cold reality can clarify thinking. But it clarifies thinking at a very tired place. The last degree of any sign is a point of fatigue. That sign has been running its cycle to a point where the wave of its energy is getting ready to break. When the weight of the past tends to overcome the fresh impetus of a new start so that in a positive sense, maybe this conjunction on uh, Friday has to do with culminating some agreements in your life, finishing off an important piece of paperwork, getting your mind wrapped clearly around something that has been puzzling you or you've been dealing with for a long period of time. But be hard-nosed about it. Be very hard-nosed about your yeses because what Saturn is always about is about take your time, be serious, Consider the long-term consequences. You may be tired in your relationship. You may be tired in your work. And you'll just agree to something. And then as Mercury and Saturn go into Scorpio and we move beyond Libra's airy, objective, intellectual, agreeable, accommodating side, we descend 
into, into Scorpio's shadow world where we go, oh my God, I just agreed to something that I don't believe and, and, and I was so sure of myself an hour or two or three ago. It's a fascinating day this Friday because of this combination of an epiphany of an awareness at one point in one field at the end of Libra in the field of nice, fair, sweet, and then shifting territory. So the rules are changing. Mercury goes into Scorpio, Saturn goes into Scorpio, and yet even with this descent of the planet of the lower mind and the planet of hard, cold reality into gut level Scorpio. And I don't mean descent in a moral sense, I just mean in an energetic sense. It's not better or worse. There's inhaling and exhaling, and Scorpio's about pulling in. But even with that going on, and Mercury and Scorpio, by the way, where it will stay until the 28th, represents the capacity to not see things as they are, but to see below the surface. Downside, suspicion, mistrust. Upside, depth of psychological and financial awareness. Because Mercury, the mind's eye, gathers information in a through a scorpionic lens. Through the lens of, <laughs> I'm sniffing what's below the surface. I'm not just buying the pretty makeup on top. Yet, even with all the seriousness of thought that that brings, the next day, again, we get another weird move. And that is that Mars, the planet of action, which has been in Scorpio, fires off and I don't give a shit, Sagittarius, it's a big world, and I'm a free person, and I'm going to do what I want, go where I want to go. Now, astrology clarifies and confuses. It clarifies by describing different fields of energy and how they can work, both on a personal level, with personal cycles and with collective cycles. Cool. But those waves sometimes go in different directions. Mercury in Scorpio is like being aware of what could go wrong. Do you have your seatbelt on? I hope everyone in here is wearing a condom or a panty shield or something to make sure, just in case anything goes wrong, extra pair of underwear, plastic pants, I don't know, whatever it is, be prepared. Be prepared, that's Scorpio. So Mercury's going into Scorpio where we, in a positive sense, may be aware of where we need to be prepared, but of course can go overboard as I just did. And yet the impulse to act, not to think, but to act, which is Mars, Mars, because since I don't give a shit, Sagittarius. Mars goes, oh, I don't care about whatever you're doing. I need to be free. I need to do my own thing. So we have a very interesting thing. This is like someone who, it's, it's like being skeptical. It's like being <laughs> skeptical and careful in your mind. And yet, sort of willing to try anything positive combination. We can put things together in both positive and negative ways. The positive combination of doing this is that the willingness to take risks, Mars and Sagittarius, I'm going to push my boundaries. Sagittarius is the half horse, half archer, shooting the arrow up into the air, going beyond the world that it's already in. So there is enthusiasm, Mars and Sagittarius. Let me start jogging. Let me go to other countries. Let me try something very new and different. Mercury in Scorpio, in a positive way, says, okay, just be careful. You want to climb a high mountain? Have good equipment. You want to go on a big adventure? Use the skepticism, the cynicism, and the security consciousness and fears of Mercury and Scorpio to prepare you. That would be a positive combination of enthusiastic action with a careful thinker. It's almost like having telling a small your small child, knowing that it's time for this child to take some risks and go a little further on their own, and yet you're standing at the edge of the playground and in careful surveillance of that child. Now, fear and optimism can sometimes cancel one another out and lead to paralysis. This is an opportunity to bring those two together. On the seventh, Mars squares Neptune. No one is responsible for their behavior on the seventh. <laughs> Mars, the planet of action in, in the Viking, the Viking sign of Sagittarius, runs into the uh, the um, the uh, the open bar, as it were, of Neptune. 
So uh, we can get a little lost or act with spirituality. But then on October 10th, and even though I'm giving you the precise date, on October 10th, an event is occurring that's really effective, maybe a week or two coming and going. So we're already getting into it, although I think we'll feel it when Saturn goes into Scorpio. What's happening is that Saturn at zero degrees of Scorpio aligns harmoniously, that's this blue line, with Neptune at zero degrees of Pisces. The planet of hard cold reality, Saturn in the badass sign of Scorpio, aligns comfortably with the planet of spirituality and forgiveness, Neptune in the compassionate sign of Pisces, in the sign of imagination. This is amazing. It's deep background stuff that I want to elaborate a little bit more on. But what it suggests is that reality, which is Saturn, and ideals and dreams and imagination, which is Neptune, can cooperate with one another. Making dreams real is what this is about. Now these are slow moving planets and Saturn does not deliver early. So I don't think it's necessarily for most of us this month going to indicate making dreams real, although if they do come true, great, be ahead of the curve. But that it's really, I think, more logically about aligning our ideals, which are Neptune and dreams, with a plan, with Saturn. And like, the, like I watch a little bit of the debate, what's your plan? to reduce the deficit. Hey, you guys, what the hell? Do you have a deficit reduction plan? Well, if not, I don't know, you know, you're not doing your job. You don't need a real plan necessarily. You need a real commitment inside of yourself. Because you can have a head full of plans that are bullshit because you, your, your guts have not signed on for the plan. But you can feel something in your gut. You can have a sense that there's a dream, an ideal, something magical and inspiring for you, and you find a place in your bones that connects to it that lets you know that you're heading in the right direction. That's really what we're starting to do. And, and although we live in more than interesting times, this particular transit is a key to an incredible period of time next year. Between July 17th and 19th, 2013, Saturn of hard, cold reality in Scorpio aligns favorably again with Neptune, aligns favorably with expansive Jupiter in Cancer and with Mars in Cancer. Over two days, which is a relatively short period of time, four planets form what we call a grand trine the most harmonious, the richest, and I know we live in crazy times. The Uranus-Pluto square really is the bottom baseline of nervous, restless, weird, what the hell's going on here? I'm spiritual one moment and going nuts. The next moment I'm calm and I'm cool and I got it and then what the heck is going on? We're living in collectively some roiling waters of transformation that none of us can accurately predict where it's taking us because these big changes, which have to do with Uranus, the planet of revolution, and Pluto, the planet of transformation, making seven 90-degree stressful squares with one another between June of this year and March of 2015, these planets take us beyond the reality of Saturn. In other words, we, we have to break the frame that culturally, collectively, the solutions that we're looking for within the current reality are probably not going to, to, to work. That it is the job or the opportunity for all of us to take our craziness, our madness, our weird ideas, and to open into the next stage of human spiritual and intellectual development. Yet while that's going on and shaking the world, or at least corresponding with a lot of craziness in the world, Saturn this month aligns with Neptune. Saturn and Scorpio can be our worst fears. Fears of poverty, fears of death, fears of environmental disaster. And yet, just as that's happening, the planet of faith, imagination, idealism, and compassion steps in and says, don't worry. Your waters may be toxic, but my ocean is big enough to absorb all of your pain. 
There's space being made that's coming up that allows us to acknowledge the deeper, darker sides of our own lives and of the world around us because it's in a larger spiritual context. It's in a place in which, although we can't describe what the cure is, we know that there is something larger than our own fears. And that comes back in a very, very strong way, as I said, in July of next year. Okay. So I'm very excited about, obviously I'm excited about the Saturn-Neptune conjunction trine because the grand trine next summer is rare. To have four planets, particularly slow-moving outer planets, which really are the bigger gears of change in our culture. To have three outer planets and one faster-moving planet lining up like that is a pretty uncommon event. And it's happening in water signs, and water is about feeling. And that means that answers come through feelings rather than intellect. And I, I love an idea that I heard many years ago. It's from a guy named Harvey Jackins, who is an Oregon guy who had some kind of therapy counseling. I forget the name of the kind of counseling that he did. But he had the line that's uh, often been repeated, we are only as intelligent as our emotions will allow us to be. You could take somebody with 180 IQ, and if they're off emotionally, they're going to be brilliantly wrong, brilliantly stupid. So the intel you know, our brains are floating in a moist environment, which is essentially emotional. And to have these planets starting this month aligning favorably in water signs means that we've got safety lines to descend into our emotions. Neptune, trying Saturn this month, and repeating again in June and July of next year is very much like having a safety line that allows you to descend into your own particular dark place and know that you can come back out of it. So uh, we can also avoid it, which is not recommended as much. Okay, so now what I want to talk about very briefly is the new moon. It's not exactly the new moon there, but it's close. The new moon in Libra. A new moon, uh, and by the way, that is on the 15th of the month. The new moon indicates a new monthly cycle. A moon, as Rick often says, and this new moon in Libra is about a fresh start in relationships. And what is the relationship that counts most? Thank you, Richard. The relationship in your head. As much as Danique and I can have differences and debates, believe me, I've had many more arguments with myself than I could possibly have with anyone else or at least discussions, or at least of seeing both sides of things. The new moon in Libra is a chance to initiate, if you're in any kind of relationship with yourself or with others, where you're feeling off balance and you want to shift it, that certainly might represent an opportunity to do that. But this new moon isn't particularly aspected. That is to say, other planets aren't hooked up to it very tightly. So I don't think it's particularly dramatic, and in fact, bigger stuff happens on the 22nd through the 25th. On the 22nd of the month, the sun moves into Scorpio. Now what happens is when you have a slow-moving planet like Saturn changing signs, it's a shift. But it's when faster-moving planets hit that, that that shift gets energized. It's almost as if slow-moving planets represent low-frequency waves that are present and very powerful but they don't become auditory until they're hit by something faster moving because that's more in our frequency range. So on the 22nd, the sun goes into Scorpio. I've already talked enough about Scorpio to not have to reiterate it too much, but on the 25th, the sun joins Saturn in Scorpio. That's the first major connection, conjunction of a planet to Saturn in Scorpio. That trine from Neptune is sweet and nice, and that's just enabling and positive. This sun in Scorpio, on, uh, joining Saturn on the 25th, is a time when we may hit the wall or hit that point of clarity. And I think, again, power. Be powerful. Don't be afraid of your power. I, you know, I think a lot of people are afraid of power because their models of power were abusive models. 
whether it was an abusive parent, an abusive sibling, an abusive teacher, an abusive boss, we all have, varying to varying degrees, models of abuse of power. And those who have had extended experience with that early in life tend to be most afraid of power or really abuse it themselves. Well, Saturn ultimately is about trust. The sun joining Saturn is the one day a year when it's probably mo the most important to trust yourself. Not to trust yourself that you won't make any mistakes, but to trust yourself enough to correct them, to be honest, and to learn from them. If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. In normal reality, the Sun-Saturn conjunction can be difficulties with the boss, the state troopers, the IRS, but we don't need to experience any of that. We can just empower ourselves. And what is the empowerment with Saturn? Consistently showing up. Saturn rewards time well spent. Discipline and showing up with consistency is where Saturn pays off. Then we have a flurry of contradictions near the end of the month. On the 28th of October, Mars opposes Jupiter. More! Mars, the planet of action, and let's go for it. Sagittarius opposes Jupiter in, I'll taste anything, once Gemini, and that certainly raises enthusiasm and a willingness to try things, but it also may have to do with overreaching, particularly because the following day, Mercury in Sagittarius, and you know, Mercury in any fire sign, Sagittarius, Aries, and Leo are fire signs, doesn't report reality as it is. It reports reality as it could be. That's fire's job. Fire's job is not to be objective and report back what any, of, what any fool with Mercury and Taurus like me can simply see with my little earthy mind. No, it's about being creative. Well, Mercury in Sagittarius runs into a square with, with Neptune on the 29th, and that can be, put that on top of a hyperactive Mars-Jupiter opposition from the day before, and I would recommend that you don't sign any long-term contracts, but that you enjoy as much freedom and exploration as you can. Exploration being the key word, because exploration means I'm just exploring. I'm not committed to an outcome. I'm open to learning. When you go with that attitude, things work well. Also on the 28th, weird, 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 lovely Venus enters her home sign of Libra. That would seem to be enough to patch over any crack in your life, to make, to make the ugly beautiful, or at least to convince yourself that it's beautiful and peaceful and harmonious, and that's very nice. But when we get into early November, Venus is going to run into Uranus and Pluto. So don't idealize relationship. Recognize that relationship has within it an inherent tension. I'm me and you're not. Well, there you go. That's a problem. <laughs> From whatever way you want to look at it. It means clearly we're not going to be the same and see the same. Okay, Venus and Libra hopefully can allow us or help us to do that more graciously. And then, just to make sure that uh, we restrain ourselves a little bit, there's a full moon on the 29th of October. And in this full moon, Saturn is joined with the sun, and Saturn is opposed the moon. Now let me talk about this full moon. This is the anti-Buddha full moon. Because the Buddha full moon is the sun in Taurus and the moon in Scorpio, which means we're moving from the deep scorpionic emotions into the peace and tranquility of being a happy Taurus. The Buddha was born, illuminated, and died under that full moon. This is the opposite. This is the full moon in Taurus. And since I'm a Taurus, I'm allowed to say, as I often do here, Taurus is a sign of fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you're any of the three, although I certainly hope you're happy. And sometimes being dumb is the best way to be happy. In the sense that Taurus is about accepting things as they are, as long as they're nice. Okay, so the full moon says Taurus is only the second sign of the zodiac. It's naive and self-indulgent. It doesn't understand the cost of things. It's too early in the story to understand exchange and relationships in a deep way, symbolically. Scorpio, of course, is the post 
Libran divorcee uh, who recognizes what things cost and is going to approach life differently from there on. So this is the naive, fat, dumb, and happy versus the lean, mean, Scorpio machine. Well, we might be conflicted there. It's the 29th. All full moons are chances of illumination. And the issue here is recognizing where you're fat, dumb, and happy, and it's too expensive. <laughs> it's just too expensive. You might not have to pay the bill right away, but you recognize that, that the long-term costs are more than what you would want to pay. But it also means to learn how to find a place of comfort. See, I think the key to living out this full moon, which can be financially transformative, transformational with respect to values, which Taurus and Scorpio have to do it in different ways, is to know what's good and right and works with you so that you can then go forward to get more, build more, do more, go further. In other words, when I started studying astrology, I started with an awful book old-fashioned book that made you want to kill yourself. So it's why there aren't that many astrologers back in those days. But uh, I was born during the full moon, and it said that if you're born during the full moon, you're going to be torn apart and miserable and unhappy in your short... The good news is you won't live long. <laughs> okay? That's the good news. Well, obviously, I wasn't going to buy into that because it was too expensive. It was a price I chose not to pay, and instead, what I did was I visualized myself, this is the Earth in the middle, with Scorpio and Taurus, which is what I've got on either side, meaning that what a full moon is, is an awakening, the aha. And the aha isn't, oh, I'm Taurus, I'm just good and going to, you know, keep drinking the same beer my pappy drank because we liked it, uh, or Scorpio, oh, I'm a shit. And and I, yet I need more shit, and I want to do more shitty things because I don't know how to fix it because I'm hungry and needy. Or I'm both. And rather than feeling pulled apart between the dark and the light, the simple and the complex, the have of self and the have not of need, it is, oh, I'm at the fulcrum. I'm right in the perfect position to go to comfort and ease where appropriate and to go to hunger and desire and passion where I need to. And that is the gift of this full moon, or one of the gifts of it. What it looks like, too, I think, on a more practical level, I think, because Saturn is involved, we're still dealing with long-term goals. And again, how many of us, you know, so, so often in life, the, the best things we do are the things that we either don't do or that we stop doing. Pluto, Scorpio's key or modern ruling planet, was described by my friend Angel Thompson many years ago as the process of addition by subtraction. And I think Scorpio is very much the same thing. Addition by subtraction. Sure, this is okay. It reminds me of a, 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 a years ago I asked a friend of mine who was very good in business, I asked him to borrow a thousand bucks to do some advertising. And he had the money, and I said to him, I'm sure I'll make the money so I can pay you back. I wasn't sure. I was just doing a sales pitch. But he said to me, whether you can pay it back, paying back the $1,000 is not the issue. The issue is, is this the most return you can get on $1,000? That's Scorpio business-like thinking. Not whether I'm getting enough, whether I'm maximizing my return on the investment. And with Saturn, join the sun in Scorpio, that kind of attitude of looking at the things you're investing time, energy, money, beliefs in to go, am I getting enough out of this? And if I do say no to this, will it open up a space of yes for something else? And maybe if you don't know what that space is, if you say no to what isn't giving you enough, then just make yourself comfy, not in an alcoholic, stoned out, unconscious way, but in a nice, safe, natural way. Not that I'm against those other issues, but I think we need to be simple here. That 
If you don't know what it is you're missing, or you can't clarify it, it seems too far away, visit the comfortable place. Visit the place of fulfillment, because from there, you can take the risk to find what it is you're really hungry for. So that's the report for this month. I thank you so much for giving your time and attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Put your birth information up here if you want me to look at your chart, and then we'll do three mini-readings.